I'm Abby. I have a lot of records and this is Vinyl Monday. So welcome to a very special episode of Vinyl Monday. If you're new here, hi! This is the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about classic albums that I love. If 20 or however many minutes long this episode is going to be aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds, both here on my channel and over on my Instagram. I'm gonna introduce this week's album a little differently. Usually I make a game out of guessing what album I'm gonna cover next. If you wanna play along, all you have to do is head over to my community tab, but I didn't even try making a game of this week's album because truth be told, I've been hyping it up for months. That, of course, is thanks to Dark Side. I will not be covering Dark Side anytime soon. I'm very sorry. Usually I save quoting album reviews for about the middle of the video, but I'm gonna read this one from my notes because I feel it's a perfect introduction. The war had lost favor with the people. The world economy was in shambles. The sitting US president exposed as corrupt and fast on the outs. Young people were coming of age in a world that left them jaded and dissatisfied. All of the above conditions would create the perfect storm for the anthem of an entire generation. Upon its release, this album would speak to an entire generation coming of age in a world where nothing was certain anymore. It was not only the release that brought the band to the upper echelons of rock music, but a work that painted a picture of life in the 70s. In time, this album would become as universal as life itself. Without further ado, this week's album, Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon. But come on, I'll just be calling it Dark Side of the Moon or most of the time Dark Side, because seriously, who the hell calls it The Dark Side of the Moon? Probably the same dorks that called Pink Floyd the Pink Floyd in 1967. Yes, I pulled out my original US copy of Piper at the Gates of Dawn for the sake of a joke, and what about it? Not taking the plastic off of that one for obvious reasons, but let's take the plastic off this week's album. So my copy is a repress. This run is from, I think, 2016, and buyer beware, as you're probably gonna see throughout this video, this cover fingerprints like crazy. Uh, I try to be as careful with it as I possibly can, but you're probably gonna tell from my B-roll that this is already starting to wear. I've covered some of the most iconic album art of all time on this channel, in the aeroplane over the sea has entered the chat, but here we have quite possibly the most iconic album art of all time. This cover was designed by Hypnosis, the artist collective consisting of Storm Thorgerson and Aubrey Powell. They worked with Pink Floyd a number of times, including my personal favorite Floyd record, Wish You Were Here. Yes, this is my alternate version of the cover. We also have George Hardy on the poster and sticker design. B-Roll Abby is going to be showing you all that mess, way too much for me to handle. Floyd wanted something very simple, but very graphic, as Storm Thorgerson said. All the prospective covers were put around a room, but really, this was the only one in the running. This album and its cover have been remixed several times for other anniversary releases of this record, the best being the photographed Prism cover, and quite possibly the worst being the 30th anniversary stained glass cover. Not a fan. On Dark Side of the Moon, we have Roger Waters on bass, vocals, and as your gatefold says, the principal lyricist, David Gilmore on guitar, synthesizer, and vocals, Nick Mason on drums and other various percussion, and Rick Wright on keys and synthesizer. We have a number of special guests on this record, including Doris Troy, Leslie Duncan, Liza Strike, and Barry St. John on backing vocals. We also have Dick Perry on sax and the incomparable Claire Torrey providing guest vocals for The Great Gig in the Sky. This record was produced by Pink Floyd themselves, with a little help from engineer Alan Parsons and his assistant engineer Peter James. 
You already knew I was going to say it. Roll transition! I know I said I wasn't going to make a habit of saying roll transition, but I just can't help myself, okay? So to best tell the story of Dark Side, I'm going to briefly go back to two albums before it. This is Metal, released in 1971. I'm not going to go into too much detail on it since I'd like to do a full-length episode on it in the future. However, I will be covering the closing track that takes up the entirety of the B-side, Echoes. If you ask me, Floyd's aha moment was Echoes. That is where Floyd went from good to great. Before metal, the guys were in a very experimental, slightly awkward phase in their career. Think Amagama, which is a great live record, but kind of an odd studio portion, and Adam Hart Mother. In subsequent years, all of the members of Floyd disowned Adam Hart Mother. After Echoes, Floyd is on to something and they know it. It's those long, drawn-out instrumentals that they're known for, but something is different. This one is more complete. The first and second movements are a showcase of David's very fluid playing style, in which he extensively uses the whammy bar to mimic a vibrato. There's five minutes of straight-up whale noises on this thing. Um, no other band could get away with that. But the way the whale noises are used in between the breakdown and going back to the core motif makes one feel like they're in a rocket falling back to Earth. Or as I always imagined it, being astral rejected. And the song is more Rick forward than the band has ever been. The guys have tapped into some weird cosmic ether. Echoes at Pompeii all but confirms this for me. Uh, performing this cosmic magic music at an arena over 2,000 years old is a little too perfect. David and Roger, as much as they're not on the same page these days, both asserted that metal, and particularly Echoes, was when the band found their direction for where they wanted to go in this new phase of their career. If there are any new or otherwise casual Floyd listeners watching this, your one takeaway from this chapter of the video should be go listen to Echoes, it's the best Pink Floyd song. Hell, it's so good that Andrew Lloyd Webber plagiarized it. Then we have Obscured by Clouds released in 72. I would hold it up here, but I don't have it. This one is considered by many to be the proto dark side. Absolutely curtains, the title track, and Childhood's End, which is basically an early version of Time, all showcase these qualities. Also happening in 72 was the conception of Dark Side. This album was developed live through a European tour. Its working titles were Eclipse and A Piece for Assorted Lunatics. There were three to four long songs making up this whole set. Uh, it's a bit of an unconventional way to develop an album, but it proved to be a great way. The guys could feel out in real time what they liked about it, what they didn't, and change it for the next night. As Nick said, if you saw the show four times, it would have been very different each night. Some of this material had been shopped around long in advance. Rick had this chord progression for a song called The Violent Sequence, pretty ironic for such a peaceful melody, that was intended for Michelangelo Antonioni's films A Brisky Point. My personal favorite of his is Blow Up because the Yardbirds are in it. The violent sequence didn't quite work out for Zabrisky Point. Floyd instead supplied them with Careful With That Axe Eugene. Roger Waters' inhale scream has entered the chat. But the guys held on to the violent sequence a little longer, reworking it into a song about war, adding sax solos by Dick Perry, and naming it Us and Them. Dark Side was recorded at EMI Studios, now known as Abbey Road, from May of 72 through early 73, and Us and Them was the first song they cut. Along with the Us and Them progression, Rick also had these chords he was tinkering around with. B minor, F, B flat, some other weird jazzy stuff. It was called the religion song with the idea that Floyd would layer church organs, choirs, and gospel sermons over it. 
They tried all these different approaches and none of them quite worked out. It was the chords themselves that were causing issues. They hadn't appeared anywhere else on the record up until this point. The central theme of the A side are inversions of E minor and A. Uh, they tried transposing the religion song to make it fit, but it sounded like shit in anything other than D minor. Over time, as the religion song fell apart, it became more of a death sequence to round out the A-side's theme of human life. Alan Parsons brings in Claire Torrey from Top of the Pops to be Floyd's personification of death. Uh, he'd heard her and thought that she'd suit the track well. As the story goes, Claire is halfway through her first take, ad-libbing with the typical woos and babies, but David stops her. I imagine he says something like, But could you try something without words? Claire does one take without words, then leaves, assuming it wasn't good enough and that it would be scrapped how wrong she was. The Great Gig in the Sky was just the working title after Religion Song was scrapped, but I guess they just couldn't think of anything better. Now, the EMI facilities proved to be so crucial to how this album would turn out. One of its unifying elements are these little interview clips that we hear dispersed throughout the record. To get these, Roger was pulling people from around the studio, sticking them in front of the mic, and recording their answers to these flashcards that he had written out. The people he collected included Roger the Hat, their roadie who provided this laugh, another roadie, Chris Adamson, opens the album with this line, Floyd's tour manager Peter Watts did the madman laugh on Speak to Me and Brain Damage. <laughs> Henry McCullough from Wings described a nasty fight he'd had with his wife the night before. Uh, he explained it by simply saying, I don't know, I was really drunk at the time. That geezer was cruising for a bruising is made to sound like his wife, but it was actually Peter Watts's wife at the time, Patricia. And Jerry O'Driscoll, the doorman at EMI, delivers my favorite line, the closing line of the record. There is no dark side of a moon, really. Matter of fact, it's all dark. Get this, Paul McCartney was recorded too, but his answers were deemed too lighthearted and left off the album. I can only imagine how that went. Roger listening through Paul's responses and going, Oh, this guy is way too happy to be on my album. This wasn't the only little project Roger got up to while recording. He also got into arts and crafts. His first wife, or second, maybe, sh I don't know, this guy's been married like five times. Whatever number wife she was, she was an artist, and she had a pottery studio at their home. Roger recorded noises around the studio, starting with one of his wife's mixing bowls with loose change inside. He cut and pasted those parts to make a seven-part loop. This tape loop got to be about 20 feet long and had to be wrapped around a mic stand to even go through the damn equipment. And because it was a loop of seven parts, money became seven four time. Fuck yeah, seven four time. That shit is sexy. And instead of messing with the key of great gig to make it fit moving into the B side, money was transposed to B minor to make sense of great gig. The guys had cutting edge technology to make the crazy idea that was dark side work, including the VCS3 synthesizer, which had one of the earliest sequencers. Alan Parsons introduced this iteration of the VCS3 to the guys, and it almost immediately became the backbone of On The Run. There's actually footage of Raj and David noodling around with On The Run in the studio, as well as footage of Nick making it very clear that he wants pie without the crust. And I'm 95% sure that inspired the line with, without, on us and them. Like, you just see the smile on Roger's face. He knows exactly what he's doing. <laughs> Most of this new technology worked great on the record, but what wasn't so successful was quadraphonic sound. So quadraphonic sound was basically four-point stereo instead of just 
two channels, left and right, or for you, I guess, left and right, there were four channels. Front left, rear left, front right, rear right. In 1972, recording in quadraphonics proved to be a lot better in theory than execution. Dark Side was an early experiment in quadraphonic recording and neither Floyd nor Parsons were satisfied with the end result. While quadraphonic sound didn't quite work as expected, Allen still had quite a few tricks up his sleeve. He'd been holding on to the sound collage of clocks uh, he made it as a way to show off what quadraphonics could do. He gave that to Floyd for the beginning of time. Parsons also had Peter James run around EMI with a mic turned on to get those footsteps and heavy breathing that we hear in On the Run. All of these elements, however disjointed they may sound to you, come together seamlessly to form this album. The track listing of Dark Side of the Moon goes as follows. <laughs> Opening up side one, we have Speak to Me, followed by Breathe in the Air. This goes right into On the Run, followed by Time, and the album is closed with The Great Gig in the Sky. Opening up side two, we have Money, which goes right into Us and Them. This flows into Any Color You Like, then Brain Damage, and the album closes with Eclipse. Dark Side of the Moon was released on March 1st, 1973, 50 years ago this week. It debuted at the London Planetarium over a shitty PA system. Floyd didn't attend for obvious reasons. And this record catapulted Floyd into mainstream success, the likes of which they had never seen before. Sure, they were doing fine with records like metal, okay? But this is where they went from British, proggy, space rock band Pink Floyd into blockbuster act, biggest rock band in the world, Pink Floyd. Floyd. It's strange to think of today, but Floyd had never really caught on in the U.S. before this. Floyd hadn't done any singles in the U.S. since 1968. That is, until they decided to release Money. While Floyd was on tour supporting the record, Dark Side slowly climbs up the charts until it hits number one. This album's commercial success funded Monty Python in the Holy Grail? That's right! Some of Floyd's initial profits from Darkseid went to fund the 70s British comedy film about King Arthur and his knights at the round table that we all memorized the script of, including the blocking, in high school and could recite on command. Or was that just me? Okay probably just me. Floyd was watching a lot of Monty Python in the studio, so for pure dumb fun and also probably tax reasons, they jumped at the chance to fund Holy Grail, and I am so glad they did. The dark side of the rainbow theory isn't real. I'm not covering it in detail here because it doesn't align with the Wizard of Oz anywhere near as much as the stoners and Sid fiends in the 70s thought it did. And at no point was the Wizard of Oz even mentioned in the studio during Dark Side production. If you want a film that actually does line up with Dark Side, and twice over, no less, Paul Blart Mall Cop 2. I wish I was kidding. This is one of the most critically acclaimed, universally beloved, and commercially successful records of all time. It's Floyd's biggest over here by a long shot. It's charted for, get this, 970 non-consecutive weeks. Do you know how long 970 weeks is? I'm, I'm gonna give you a moment here to crunch some numbers just in case this is another Abby bad at math moment. That's a little over 18 years. 
18 years. And of those years, 14 were consecutive. Here I have to mention my favorite recording of a good chunk of Dark Side's material, Pulse. I love the Pulse show. Aside from David not quite hitting the mark with his time solo and Pulse great gig being pretty rough, it's clear their guest singer was having an off day. Uh, Pulse is an incredible performance of Dark Side of the Moon. So as I mentioned in the first half of the video before the costume change, Claire Torrey left EMI Studios that day thinking her vocals did not make the cut for the album. She was paid like $400 in today's money, just left and went on with her day. And that's because uh, Claire was never notified that her vocals did make the cut for the album. She only found out when the album was released. So in 2004, she sued EMI and Floyd's asses off for royalties and songwriting credits. She won presumably a fat chunk of change. And in later presses like mine, we now see vocal composition by Claire Torrey in the liner notes. Dark Side has now spawned four generations of Floyd fans. The OG fans, the Boomers, their kids, the Gen Xers, then the Millennials, and as of very recently, a fourth generation. In February of this year, something really interesting happened. Of all the songs to do it, Great Gig in the Sky, blows up on TikTok, bringing in a whole new group of Zoomer Floyd fans. See, I had fresh Roger David drama on my 2023 bingo card. It coincides a little bit too perfectly with the 50th anniversary of this record. But what I didn't have on my 2023 bingo card was Pink Floyd TikTok trend. Uh, speaking of the Roger David drama, Roger Waters says he is going to re-record all of Dark Side of the Moon with his spoken word poetry and no guitar solos because, and I quote, it's his project and he wrote it. Okay, Roger. It's literally not your project, but okay. Whatever you say, horseman. Oh, we almost made an entire Floyd video without making a Roger Waters horseman joke. I feel like that's another secondary counter we need to make on this channel to, to run in tandem with our swear, but that one would just always be at zero. This is one of the most simultaneously overrated and overhated albums of all time. So, what do I think of this uh, cultural monolith of a record? What do I think of Dark Side of the Moon? <laughs> Going in. It's 2023 now, it's this record's 50th anniversary, and it's been in my life since its 40th. In eighth grade, I told one of my study hall buddies that I really liked Smashing Pumpkins, so in turn, he listed off three psych groups that he was really into at the time. The Jimi Hendrix Experience, Animal Collective, and Pink Floyd. Um, our lives have been weaving in and out of each other's ever since. Uh, we were in choir together in high school. We won an academic award alongside each other our senior year. Uh, he most recently got me really paying attention to the 13th floor elevators. And here I am reviewing Dark Side in 2023, 50 years down the line for this record's release and 10 years down the line from when I was first introduced to it. Um, this has grown alongside me, the likes of which few other albums have. I think the only other album that has been in my life as consistently for as long as Dark Side is Siamese Dream by Smashing Pumpkins. Dark Side's half-century-long success is due to its trifecta of strongest qualities, number one being its clarity. 
In most every other instance across rock and roll history that I can think of, um, where a band or a member of the band has produced the record themselves, there were significant failures. One of my cardinal beliefs as a music critic, ew, is that bands need a producer. They need a fresh set of eyes and ears to come in and kill the darlings. The one and only exception I can think of is this record. Floyd knew exactly what they wanted this record to sound like and exactly how to execute it. That is exceedingly rare in the canon of rock bands. Without any assistance from a producer, but with crucial input from Alan Parsons, we stand audio engineers on this channel, Floyd was able to assemble a thematically clear and musically cohesive body of work. However, you can attribute a lot of what makes Dark Side special back to its preceding records, metal and obscured by clouds. But there is a big leap forward unique to Dark Side, and that is Roger's writing. This time was Roger's coming of age. He realized at almost 30 that uh, I'm not waiting around for life anymore. This is my life, and this is what I make it. Um, being the astrology bitch that I am, I love Roger's continued use of the sun and the moon imagery throughout this album. It illustrates light and dark, good and bad, masculine sun, feminine moon, uh, the life force as opposed to the death force, as he once said. There's this thing in Italian high renaissance art called, excuse my pronunciation, chiaroscuro, um, light and shade. You work with both to create a lifelike portrait. Dark Side of the Moon uses light and dark to create a picture of life. I believe Raj working through his grief for former Floyd frontman and good friend Sid Barrett was how Raj honed his writing craft. Sid shows up a lot more on Wish He Were Here, but He's scattered all over Dark Side too. Brain damage in particular is an ode to him. Here is where Raj honed his writing enough to take a subject like mental illness and examine it on both the macro and micro levels. Uh, this leads us into Dark Side's next strongest point. It's cohesion. I rarely intend to listen to this whole album. I'll throw on time or on the run because they're bangers. And then it just kind of happens. This album runs so smoothly that to stop it at any time feels like a crime. Dark Side is masterfully sequenced. There is not a single track that I move around, add, or replace. To me, a huge reason why this sequencing works is the needle lift between the A side and the B side. So back in the Let It Be video, I explained a few of my personal commandments that I go by when I'm evaluating music, and this was one of them. Commandment one. Thou shalt champion listening to the album as it was originally intended. Allow me to explain. Great Gig in the Sky is the end of the A-side for a reason. It marks the conclusion of the theme of accepting mortality. There's that break, and then you move on to money. So why in the cinnamon toast f**k? Do streaming services of Dark Side of the Moon crossfade Great Gig in the Sky and money? Having a crossfade ruins that moment. It mixes the two halves of the album, the micro and macro levels of its themes. It mixes the red and green paint to make brown. You just don't do that. So that moment right there is why I encourage you to seek out Dark Side on vinyl, not because it's a must own. I don't believe there's any such thing as an essential album for a vinyl collection. You collect what you want to collect. However, 
I think you should find Dark Side on vinyl because it didn't screw up this album's sequencing. You would be listening to this piece of work as it was originally intended. Both cohesion and clarity have a hand in Dark Side's third strongest element, its timelessness. There's a reason this thing has inducted four generations of Floyd fans. Uh, Dark Side was everyone's first Floyd album, even if it wasn't your first Floyd album, per se. It was your first album by way of seeing this iconic album art on, say, a mug or a t-shirt. There's no aging out of this record's themes. It starts with the idea of accepting mortality. Uh, the idea of life and death takes up the entirety of the A side, and rightfully so. Then we have modern life. It crops up a little bit on Breathe and on the Run, but it's mostly focused on money. Then war on us and them, mental illness on brain damage, and all of these themes are tied together on the closing track, Eclipse. Remember all the 70s world events that I listed off at the beginning of this video? Um, student protests, an economy in shambles, a war that no one actually wants, uh, a whole generation coming of age feeling isolated, cynical, and like nothing is certain anymore? All of that has happened in the three years since I wrote that review. I wrote the retrospective review quoted at the beginning of this video. I would have been like 20 at the time. It was a term paper for an American history class all about the 70s. I took this album by a British band and attributed its success in the States to the mass upheaval happening because of the Vietnam War. I twisted the essay prompt around to make it an album review, and if that's not the most Abigail DeVoe thing you've ever heard, then I don't know what is. The way Dark Side addresses life in the modern world, whether you're listening in 1973 or 2023, or, or any year between, it makes it timeless. Shout out to Nick Mason for assembling the Speak To Me sound collage. Uh, it's the thesis of the whole album in a way. I also love Nick's work on time between that spacey, percussion intro and the drum fill that leads into the lyrical portion. I love On the Run, it's Travel Anxiety the musical, but I have to say I prefer the Pulse recording over this one. Rick just totally goes off on that thing, just whacking out the sequencer. And while I don't necessarily prefer it to the original, I also love Pulse Money. That breakdown is fresh as hell. If there's any track that never quite measured up to the magic of the original version, I think it's time. Um, this David solo was like lightning in a bottle. He never quite captured that fire in him that he had recording the album version on any of the live recordings I've heard. I love David's tone on this record. It's just the right blend of delay, fuzz, I think univibe, and that wacky sh** that he do with his vibrato where he half does it with the strings and half the whammy bar. I first heard Time at age 16 and it stuck like a thorn in my side ever since. And it still fucks me up. There's this line that I never quite understood because I guess I was just always singing along to the backing vocals there. I have a habit of singing to the backing vocals when they're good. Um, and just yesterday morning while I was making my coffee, uh, I had Dark Side open on Spotify. I was listening to it and I happened to scroll down to the genius lyrics. I never knew what the hell David was saying after every year is getting shorter and never seemed to find the time. Turns out he was saying plans that either come to naught or half the page of scribbled lines. That hit me like a truck because half a page of scribbled lines is basically what I do every day. It's the backbone of what you're seeing right now, except in this instance, it's 
12 full pages of scribbled lines and god this video is long. The guests on the back half of Dark Side are what make it so special. That B-side would be nothing without Dick Perry's solos on money. Man is that thing dirty, it's so cool. And then cooling things down on us and them. I also have to spotlight Doris Troy, Leslie Duncan, and Liza Strike on this thing. Uh, they don't get anywhere near enough praise in other reviews of Dark Side. Uh, us and Them was my first Floyd song at age 13, and even though I didn't totally understand the meaning of the lyrics yet, uh, I understood the power of perfect backing vocals. And their interjections on brain damage, specifically this one. They're impossible not to sing with. If Floyd touched the heavens with Dark Side, then these three ladies are the choir waiting at the gates. I'm really gonna miss when Great Gig in the Sky was a deep cut, but man, am I happy that my generation has taste. Though Claire Torrey is on this record for all of five minutes, she steals the show. She truly gave the performance of a lifetime, and she's another one of the MVPs of this record. The other MVP of Dark Side, and in my opinion, the not-so-secret weapon of Pink Floyd, Rick Wright. Of course, you have On the Run, the wackier that song gets, the better, and there's Great Gig. Despite how soaring Claire's vocals are, how she makes that so lofty and those bombastic organs, Rick's piano part still manages to make the song feel intimate. I imagine him accompanying Claire in the studio that day, uh, giving her a soft smile and a nod as her cue before she just goes off. And again, Us and Them, his delicate touches, like this flourish here that I always loved, um, are the song's much-needed grounding. He was the bridge between the human and the machine sides of Floyd. The other little hidden moments that I love on this record are David screwing around or otherwise ad-libbing through his solos. He does it all through Any Color You Like, and of course, at the end of Money Into Us and Them, culminating with one of the funniest moments on any Floyd record, Behold! I always point out when a band had fun recording their album, because you can tell. If David talking on his tongue is any indication, these guys had no idea they were recording a career, decade, or era-defining record. They were just four guys and their team exploring this crazy shared idea. This album is the album that encapsulates the human experience. It's a mistake to think it only covers the dark stuff. Dark Side is a prime example of the indomitable spirit of man. Musically, artistically, technically, thematically, I believe that Dark Side of the Moon is one of music history's triumphs. Floyd tapped into that weird cosmic magic again and put their finger on the pulse of humanity. My personal favorites on this one are On the Run slash Time slash Graking in the Sky, Money, Us and Them, and Brain Damage. Remember, if you want to keep up with all of the Vinyl Monday faves, I have a Vinyl Monday Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it weekly. And that is it. That is uh, definitely the most monolithic record I've covered on this series. That was Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. What do you think of this record? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about the albums that I love, and I know you are going to have a lot to say about this one. And if you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11 a.m. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next week. Bye. There is no dark side in the moon, really. Matter of fact, it's all dark.